Hello, everyone. I want you to welcome. Uh, I want to welcome you all here on behalf of the Native Plant Society of Texas uh, Cross Timbers Chapter. We have a good program coming up with uh, Carol Garrison of the John Bucker Sands uh, Wetlands. Cindy, would you like to go ahead and uh, introduce our speaker? So Carol Garrison is a third generation Texan and has been at. Uh, she has been a North. Texas Master Naturalist since 2015. She's been an educator at the John Bunker Sands Wetland Center for four years and has just been promoted to education coordinator. Congratulations, Carol. Thank you. Um, when she isn't teaching about wetland ecology, wildlife conservation and stewardship, she enjoys gardening in her front yard and making observations for iNaturalist at her favorite walking area, which is the Spring Creek Forest Preserve in Garland. Now, most of us in the Native Plant Society of Texas really appreciate the fact that our native plants are beautiful and they attract wildlife. Um, tonight, we're going to be learning about native plants and their, how they are being used to naturally clean municipal water. Carol, Carol will be providing detailed information on the critical role that these plants play in the urban water cycle. All right, well, thank you for joining us, Carol, and the meeting is yours now. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I, I'm really hoping everybody has a good time. I presented this um, topic actually to another chapter of the Native Plant Society and got really good responses. So I'm looking forward to, to sharing my passion for this particular um, place where I work at and kind of give you a history of it. So um, presentation is going to divide into a history and exactly how this particular man-made wetland came to be, um, the, a little bit of chemistry and biological function of the plants, how they clean the water. And then I'm going to go into some of the specific specific plants and how and why they were selected to specifically enhance the natural water cleaning. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started. All right. So like I said, um, where I work at is the John Bunker Sands Wetland Center. I know most of you are going to be out in the western area. And so the municipal water that's being recycled through this particular facility in Seagoville isn't your water. But I happen to also be a customer of the North Texas Municipal Water District. So when I talk about this municipal water, it is something that is quite near and dear to me because it literally is the water that I take a bath in and drink and make my iced tea out of. Um, so why is the Wetland Center named after John Bunker Sands? Um, as a matter of fact, John Bunker Sands managed this large um, 5,000 acre ranch all the way back in the late 70s and the 80s. He himself was a naturalist, not unlike myself, um, except he absolutely loved to duck hunt. And so he had this property and he really wanted to work on getting a better intrinsic value out of the land. He actually traveled to Africa and learned about holistic ranch management, which is a practice by which you move the cattle around on a more frequent basis so that those flat hooves don't compact the soil and reduce erosion. And it really promotes having a seasonal crop of plants that you can grow, that actually actual fodder for the cows. He came back to this particular ranch um, out in Seagoville and he divided up the plots so that he could move the cattle around, but he did discover that there was a particular area within the 5,000 acres that was frequently prone to flooding and had saturated soil a lot of the time, wasn't so great to grow any of his fodder crops, and it also wasn't too safe for the cattle. So he came up with a fantastic idea. He decided he was going to flood that area and create a wetland. He actually reached out to environmental engineers, got himself a pretty good survey. He reached out to, to a bunch of biologists that specifically focus on water plants and got himself a really good list of plants. The only thing he had to do was get permission to breach the East Fork of the Trinity River, which was about a mile east of his 5,000 acre ranch. Despite being um, quite a prominent individual, he is the descendant of Caroline Rose Hunt, who's not able to get permission. It actually takes congressional approval to, um, to breach such an important river as the Trinity River. And unfortunately, his plans had to be shelved. But you can probably gather the fact that I work at the wetland, that things were, were put in motion that still allowed this particular concept to come to fruition, uh, despite um, initially um, John Bunker Sands not being able to get permission to breach that levee. 
So I'm going to do just a tiny bit of geography review for everybody so that they kind of know exactly what we're talking about as far as the location of the wetland. We've got the Red River up there at the top. And we have Lake Texoma, which is a major reservoir for Oklahoma. We've got the lake that's in the middle that's right here, if you can see my mouse right here, that is the Lake Lavon goes down to Lake Ray Hubbard. You can see the East Fork of the river. It actually joins up with the main stem. And for all of us that actually are connected to the East Fork, after the East Fork joins up with that fork that goes through Dallas proper, then we call that the main stem. And that main stem travels all the way down through Houston. And it actually dumps into Trinity Bay out um, into the Galveston area. Now, I'm sure we're all quite familiar with zebra mussels, but the zebra mussels are the first um, kind of a participant in the story of exactly how this wetland came to be. Um, zebra mussels are an invasive little colonizing uh, mussel from the Ukraine. Um, and the reason why we don't like them very much is because they tend to colonize on man-made surfaces and their very favorite man-made surface to cling to happen to be water infrastructure pipes. And if you have a bunch of zebra mussels that form a plaque on the inside of a water pipe, like you see right there, it increases the pressure of the water. And before you know it, we have burst pipes. So for this reason, we all want to avoid zebra mussels. They are an invasive species, so it's also illegal to transport them across state line. Now, the North Texas Municipal Water District, that's the provider to the water in all, of the, all the North Texas area, not Dallas County. Um, not Dallas, but a lot of the Dallas County, Collin County, um, Kaufman County, um, into, into Rockwall, all of those areas. If you're, we're talking about an area from all the way up north into Anna and Frisco and all the way down and um, actually south of where we are in Seagaville, all the way to Farmersville across. So just before you get to um, the line of the Dallas city itself. Some of the most rapidly growing cities. So water access is very important and we don't want to have those zebra mussels getting into the water supply. So unfortunately, back um, in the late 90s, the North Texas Municipal Water District was not able to get any more water from Lake Texoma because Lake Texoma was diagnosed with an infestation of these zebra mussels. Overnight, the water district had to turn off the water that they were getting from Lake Texoma, which was about 25% of their water supply. At that point, they realized they needed to do something significant to make up for that water loss. And so they looked at their options. And as you can, as you well know, in Texas, if you need more water, that means building another reservoir. A building a reservoir takes about 20 to 25 years. It takes billions of dollars and it takes a lot of land. Um, at the point that the water shortage became a serious issue for the water district, they knew something faster and quicker was going to have to be done. And so they took a model from Europe and they decided to do a water reuse wetland to be able to get water supply. Now, those zebra mussels were just one problem because at the same time as zebra mussels were discovered in Lake Texoma, we have ourselves one of the worst Texas droughts in the history of Texas. So here we are in the late 90s and all of a sudden we have this serious drought. Um, parts of um, Lavon Lake were actually completely dry in some of the, some of the most um, Western fingers of that lake. And so the water shortage became a much more serious thing. And so really the water district had to get serious about how they were going to supplement their water supply. At the same time as zebra mussels and at the same time as the drought, Everybody that didn't live in Texas decided to come move to Texas to the tune of about 293 people a day as a net gain in Texas. The only thing that's really stopped the gain of that 200 to 300 people per day was literally the pandemic, and we're already seeing a resurgence back into our population gains, but we did have a pretty good stagnant rate there for almost two years. So this is kind of a review here. You see Levon Lake up there. You see Lake Ray Hubbard, which is the res reservoir for the actual city of Dallas. And you see all of those orange triangles. Now, when, this, when the North Texas Municipal Water District decided they were going to build a wetland, they knew they had to get that water from a, from, a, from a source connected to the waste treatment plants. So every one of those orange triangles you see, that is a waste treatment plant. Every waste treatment plant in Texas is going to be connected to a creek. They take the municipal water, it runs through the waste treatment, so all of the things that we ought not be flushing under the toilet, everything from those plastic soldiers that the grandkids and the kiddos put into their water to the um, supposed um, disposable wipes to feminine products. They clean all those solids out. They flocculate the water and they get that product to where it is not harmful to the environment, but it is certainly far from drinkable. 
That product is called effluent and they release that effluent into the nearest creek. Now, all of the creeks, as you can see, they are all eventually going to lead to the East Fork of the Trinity River. So the goal was to pull the water out of the East Fork of the Trinity River because depending on the season, the East Fork of the Trinity River can be anywhere from a high of 80% to a low of about 20% effluent. That's why during really rainy seasons, the East Fork of the Trinity River is quite a lovely river and smells quite nice. Uh, but but in the middle of a really dry spell where it hasn't rained in a very long time and the percentage of effluent is higher in the water, you really can tell that it is a that it's a high percentage of effluent in the water. So when they were looking to get um, a location along the East Fork of the Trinity River, this is where good luck came into play because one of the gentlemen that was on the board of directors for the North Texas Municipal Water District, he lived in Combine and he drove past the ranch where John Bunker Sands managed that property. So he told the water district, you know, you ought to contact the Sands family and see if they're interested in purchasing, selling the land to you for purchase. So the water district approached them um, in a bit of amazing serendipity, the water district reached out to the exact same environmental engineering group, which was Allen Plummer and Associates, and they also reached out to the same group of biologists to get a good survey of plants. So when they went to the Sands family to present this plan, they were already bringing familiar partners in with them, and they were able to use many of the ideas that John Bunker had for the original pond. Unfortunately, John Bunker did pass away from cancer. He did not get to see his wetland um, in his lifetime, but his family, his descendants um, come to the wetland on a regular basis, and it is definitely a, a source of pride and familial legacy that he started this particular project, even though he wasn't able to, to see it come to, to light. So that's exactly how we get. We get the affluent out of those waste treatment plants. That water is um, flows into the East Fork of the Trinity River, and then that water is taken from the Trinity River and is cleaned naturally. So let's talk about exactly how that happens. So this is um, a detailed map of the East Fork Wetland Project. When it first started out, they called it the East Fork wa Raw Water U Reuse. And you can imagine people weren't too keen on the word raw water. I'm not sure why, but they ended up changing it just to the East Fork Wetland Project. Now it is located right on the edge of Seagaville and Combine, and that's Highway 175 that's dividing the, the very northern section from the rest of it. So we're going to start at the top, and you see those six chambers there, and that is connected to the intake station. Now remember that John Bunker, he could not get um, permission to breach the river, so you're probably wondering exactly how the water district was able to do that. That's because they did not breach the river. They dredged underneath the river. They have a large water pipe that pulls the water out. They're there is an engine housed in a concrete building that you can see right off of 175. So they're pulling the water out of the river and the levees are completely intact, protecting all the residents around there from any catastrophic flooding. So you get to those first six, those first six tanks up there, and those are called the sedimentation basins. They're just large um, dredged out um, shallow spots in the ground, not unlike some of the overflow um, flood control that you'll see on the sides of the roads where you see that dished out shape. And the water sits there for about 24 hours. The main goal of that is to let the sediment of the East Fork of the Trinity River settle down so that they have a cleaner water product to flow through the rest of the wetland. The plan was actually on a periodic schedule to scrape all of the silty goodness out of the bottom of those sedimentation tanks and actually sell it as fertilizer. But it's been operating now for over 11 years and they still have not had enough sediment from the East Fork of the Trinity River to even bag it up. So um, a lot less sediment in this proportion, this particular part of the Trinity River than I think that they were originally planning on. After 24 hours, they open up the first set of gates or weirs and they let the water naturally flow due to the photography photog of the land through that large central section. Um, as that water flows through that section, you'll see that there is many cells in there. They don't actually follow through every single one of those cells. They actually go in what's called a train. So there's either going to be a train that's on the east, the center, or the western side. After the water flows through this particular cell for about three to four days, it collects in the deep water section right there at the bottom. Again, there's another set of gates or weirs, and the, those gates are opened, and then the water floods into the lower southern section. 
Again, the water flows through a set of those cells. It doesn't flow through every single one of them, and it collects in the very end of that particular cell in the deep water channel, and that is where we have the pup station. That station has five 3,000 horsepower engines, and they propel that water through an underground pipe 43 miles north all the way back to Levon Lake, where it mixes with the existing lake water to add to the volume of the reservoir, and that is the source that the water is pulled from at the water treatment plant in Wiley that is right on the banks of the reservoir. So I'm going to go back to the picture before. So now if you look at this, we really have ourselves a beautiful urban water cycle. We have all of the people that are in Garland and Richardson and Frisco and Anna and McKinney. They are flushing their toilets, putting their water down the dishwasher. That water is flowing and through the sewer system to the, way, to the waste treatment plants. It is then processed, released as a fluent, goes into the creeks. The creeks flow into the East Fork. The water flows down into the East Fork. It's pulled up into the wetland. It runs through the wetland for about two weeks. And then the water is pumped back to Levon Lake to be added to the volume of the water with that within that lake. And then that lake water then is completely cleaned and sterilized and has fluoride added to it at the, way, at the water treatment plant. And then that water is dispersed into the water towers and we start the cycle again. Now, when you look at the pictures and you look at that tiny little wetland down there at the bottom, it doesn't really look like it's large enough to add much of any water content compared to look how big Lake Ray Hubbard or look how big Levon Lake is. But the thing you have to realize is the volume of water that is in that, that little wetland there, that little footprint, that is completely filled, emptied, and cycled again every 14 days. So throughout a year, the amount of water that goes through that wetland is almost the same as the entire water that's sits in Levon Lake and only gets added to if it rains. So it's an incredible supplement to the water supply. And it was quite evident when we had our most recent drought that, that the customers of the North Texas Municipal Water District never went to stage four water restrictions because there was adequate water due to the water input from that municipal water reuse. Now, usually at this point, I have a few people that say, wait a minute, if you're taking the water out of the East Fork of the Trinity, and that goes all the way down to Houston and eventually into Trinity Bay, are you stealing water from Houston? And some people really don't seem to care that water be stolen from Houston, but we're absolutely not removing any water from Houston because we're simply reusing the water that as we have more people flushing the toilets and emptying their bathtubs, we're reusing that water that would already be a higher volume going down into the system. So we're reusing the municipal water, not reducing the water that goes down there. They do have tight regulations. They have water monitoring stations in Lavon Lake. They have monitoring stations right at the intake where they take the water out of the East Fork of the Trinity River. They monitor the water at each of the three sections. And then they also water monitor the water as it is flowing back into Levon Lake. So there is a very, very tight control of water because we don't want to impair the water flow that goes all the way down to Houston. All right, so what is a wetland? We've got ourselves going to a lot of trouble to build this thing. And remember I told you that the reason why we don't like to build reservoirs too often is because they're hideously expensive. Um, instead of costing billions, the East Fork Water Reuse Project only cost 280 million. And the most expensive part of the whole thing was the, th was the 43 mile underground water pipe that connects the water reuse station all the way back to Levon Lake. That's the most expensive part of it. So what is a wetland and what's the point of it? Um, most of the time when I'm teaching this to kids and I ask them, so is a wetland always wet? They always say, yes. Um, actually, a wetland naturally isn't always wet. It has very much a seasonal um, quality to it. But I'm gonna read you the exact definition of a wetland. It's an area that has inundated or is saturated by surface or groundwater, whether fresh or um, brackish, at a frequency and duration that allows the support of the prevalence of vegetation that is adapted for life in a saturated soil condition. So it has to have enough water during its growing season to support the plants that we would consider to be a wetland plant. So if you have enough saturation to keep all of your hydrophytes alive, then that's going to qualify as a wetland. Um, there are many different kinds of wetlands. Um, the most common that you're going to hear of are swamps, marshes, bogs, and fens. 
Um, so we're going to talk about swamps, marshes, bogs, and fens, and then we're going to have a little bit of a calculation as to what do we think this particular man-made wetland is. When you think about swamps, think trees. Um, if someone tells you they've got a wetland and it has a whole bunch of beautiful cypress trees like, say, Caddo, that's going to be a swamp. If someone says, you know what, mostly this is due to overflow of rains or in a brackish situation, it's overflow of tides and there are very little trees except on the edge habitat, excellent nutrients and a prevalence of grasses, then we're talking about a marsh. Bogs. Now those are a completely different story because now we're talking about not a nutrient rich environment. We're talking about mostly peat. We're talking about a clay surface that doesn't drain. So once the water enters it, it tends to sit and we have ourselves carnivorous plants. And these plants are carnivorous because they can't get a nutrition out of the soil that they are growing in that they actually have to trap insects to get the nutrition they need. The last type of wetland that, that we're gonna talk about are fens, and fens are quite a bit related to a bog. A fen though has some sort of seepage of fresh water through that clay, um, and you're gonna see these more um, like when you go into the hill country where there's some sort of um, ability and a crack in that normally impervious clay area for fresh water to get into so that you have a little bit more of a nutrient level and it's not such a non-nutrient um, situation like you have in a bog. However, if you have a fen and that, that seepage area gets clogged up by too much detritus, too much dead material, it's very easy for a fen to turn into a bog. So if I tell you that there are this, this man-made wetland that we have here is being supplied by a continuous source, which is pulling water out of the East Fork of the Trinity River, the type of wetland that we would say this is, is most definitely a marsh. High prevalence of grasses, and these grasses are going to be used to naturally clean the water. Now, wetlands have many benefits. Number one, we have reduction of water pollution. Number two, we have flood control. Marsh, whether it's a marsh, whether it is a swamp, it's a huge area that has the ability to store an incredible amount of water. And we know that when you can actually slow down water, you can slow down erosion, you can slow down flooding, and you can allow for ground recharge, all of the next purposes. So when we love, when we give water a chance to sit, be still, and then slowly settle in, we're going to really reduce um, the flooding that we're having and we'll be able to um, recharge our groundwater and our erosion control. I think we all understand that flood control and the use of wetlands um, has been well reflected in Houston. Um, down there, they took a lot of their flood control areas and they covered them in an impervious um, structure called concrete. And now instead of having those 100 year floods every 100 years, they actually are having them every three to four years. And if you go down to Houston right now, you'll see huge areas that they're having to take all of their construction out and they're having to restore a lot of their um, wetland areas so that the water has somewhere to sit so that we don't have such catastrophic flooding. The last two benefits that we get out of wetlands are wildlife habitat and, and recreation. And we've all seen this fantastic picture of all of our upland plants with those beautiful long hair-like roots growing down into the ground looking for water. However, these beautiful long roots are not what we see when you go to the wetland and you see all of the hydrophytes. Um, here is a picture that I took of a cattail that I dug up and washed all of the nasty hydric soil. It's a shame there's not smell-o-vision on Zoom because um, even though the water was clear at this point, these roots really smell quite terrible because of the hydric soil. And you can see that these roots are, are quite thick. As a matter of fact, these particular plants, most of them, we really wouldn't call them roots. We would call them rhizomes. And the reason why is that this structure has what we call pups or young breaking off of them. If it's a root, that means its sole purpose is to bring in nutrition. But we've got ourselves a rhizome, and off the rhizomes, we have rootlets, and off of those rootlets, we have tiny ciliary hairs. And in a second, I'll show you these exact structures here that I actually got my, my microscope out to get some really good photos to show you the detail of these tiny ciliary hairs of these hydrophytes. And here you can really see, you looked at that large structure. This branch you see here is one of those small structures. All of these tiny, tiny ciliary 
filaments we're seeing here, these are too, too, too small for the naked eye to see. But these ciliary filaments are where all of the activity is going on at the wetland and exactly how we are able to clean the water naturally. So let's talk about exactly how this, these particular plants clean the water. So I've got a lovely cartoon of a cattail here. It's got its rhizome anchored into the hydric soil and we've got our water there. And the first thing we're gonna see is that we're gonna have those nutrients. Now we like to say the word nutrients cause that sounds nice and the plant loves nutrients but from our perspective, from the human being side of things, they're not nutrients, they're pollutants. Um, we study several pollutants at the wetland and are measured um, on a very frequent basis. The main nutrients that we talk about are phosphates and nitrates. The nitrates are the breakdown from our liquid and solid waste, and the phosphates are broken down from all of our soap products. I tell the students, if it makes bubbles in the water, then those that resulting um, leftover you're going to have in the water are the phosphates. Um, if I was giving this presentation in a highly agricultural area, I would really talk about the fact that these um, chemicals would be the result of fertilizers. But in a population dense area like DFW, it really is our body waste and all of our soap products that contribute to the phosphates and nitrates in the water. But the plant doesn't see the phosphates and nitrates as pollutants, they truly see them as nutrients. So how are they going to get the nutrients out of the water and leave the water cleaner for us? Well, they're going to use a structure called a um, When you have a plant that is a hydrophyte, it has a really unique structure within the stalk of it called a ranchyma. And this ranchyma acts as a two-way gas exchange. These plants can take oxygen and transport oxygen down, and they can also take broken down inert chemicals and deposit them into the atmosphere. So the first thing that's going to happen, these plants, like all other plants, are going to use their chlorophyll and they're going to produce photosynthesis, they're going to go through photosynthesis and they're going to produce oxygen. But instead of releasing the oxygen out into the atmosphere, they are going to send that oxygen down into the area of their rhizome and the rhizome plus the soil that it's anchored into and the water right above the soil is called the rhizosphere. They're going to transport that oxygen down into the rhizosphere. And when they transport that oxygen down into the and to the rhizosphere, it is definitely on purpose. It is to attract beneficial and symbiotic bacteria. So as the bacteria bind up with the nitrates and the phosphates, they actually stabilize it and get it into the area where the plants can actually take those chemicals and draw them into those ciliary fragments, those filaments that I showed you. And it gets the method of ion exchange as those plants actually release oxygen out in between the interstitial spaces of the cells, it leaves an ion exchange, and that allows the plant to take up those chemicals. So they literally extract those chemicals from the water in a process called phyto extraction. They break down those chemicals, not unlike we break down whatever we take in to eat. They break down those chemicals into products that they can use. And then they release the products they can't use in the form of phytovolatilization. Now, not all of the chemicals that these plants take up can be released in the process of phytovolatilization, and I'm, we're going to talk about one of the cases in which they can't. The main one that they can phytovolatilize really well are the nitrates. They actually break it down into completely inert nitrous gas, and they release that gas right out um, up through the arenchyma and out through the stomas in their leaves and into the atmosphere. Um, in the case of the phosphates, unfortunately, plants don't break that particular chemical down into a form that they can phytovolatilize, and so they actually sequester it either in their leaves or they sequester it back down into the rhizosphere and they release those chemicals back into the water. Now, in the case of the cattails and the bulrush, they actually leave the phosphate into the stems. And so every December, the water district actually does a prescribed burn of the wetland to release that um, phosphate gas into the atmosphere. Um, we wait until the wind is just right, not blowing on to 175 because the smoke is quite dark. It's a black acrid smoke and they have to put out a lot of warnings into the people that live in the area to make sure that nobody with respiratory sensitivities um, is harmed. And they do small batch burnings um, all throughout the winter months. When we take that phytostabilization of the bacteria, the phyto extraction, the phytodegradation, and the phytovolatilization, all of those processes together 
are called phytoremediation. And that's phyto, and phyto means plant, and remediate is to bring balance. So through a natural digestive and usage process by the plant, they are bringing the water to better balance. I really try to explain, plants aren't doing this because they love us and they want our water to be clean. We just happen to have a fantastic symbiotic relationship with plants that the nasty chemicals that we put into the water, these plants consider it to be nutrients. So, when we talk about these wetland plants at the wetland, there's three different types, and all of these plants were purposefully selected by the North Texas Municipal Water District to pull out particular pollutants and to be able to survive the environment. The three types of plants that we have are the submerged, the floating, and the emergent. Um, submerged plants spend their entire life cycle underneath the water. The floating plants spend the most of their life cycle actually floating atop the surface with maybe some root structure dangling down into the water. And the emergent plants are, are like the classic example I showed you of the cattail. They've got a rhizome that's anchored in that hydric soil, but they have a green structure that emerges out of the water and they perform photosynthesis above the water's surface. Now, you're probably wondering, will the emergent plants really sound like they'd be the most efficient? Well, the thing we have to keep in mind is that having a combination of these plants, they have different tolerances, they have different abilities to take out the chemicals. And so by combining submerged, floating, and emergent, we find ourselves with a year-round process so that the water is being cleaned extremely well, even in the middle of winter. So I'm going to go into detail on some of these plants because they weren't just picked because they look good and they weren't just picked because they're efficient. It's really a good combination and I want everybody to, to appreciate the value of these plants and exactly how they contribute to the natural water cleaning. So the first one we're going to talk about is the coontail and it is um, Ceratophyllum demersum. You might also call this plant hornwort or rigid hornwort or even coon tail, coon's tail. In addition to being a fantastic phytoremediator, coontail is an excellent cover for fish fry, and it's also a great habitat for our aquatic macroinvertebrates. Um, so whenever we have a really good coontail uh, population, we already know we're going to have a really good place for all of those little plants to hang out. Now, here are some pictures I took of the coontail. And by the way, all the photos that you see here of the wetland, I took myself and I took recently. So if any of you are inclined to come visit us at the Wetland Center, the pictures you see here, I guarantee you, if you walk out on the boardwalk on Saturday morning when we're open, um, you're going to see all of this scenery. So there's that beautiful um, coontail. It is um, completely submerged. The only time it's going to break the surface of the water is if the water is actually less high than the length of the plant and then it kind of lays over into the surface of the water. Coontail is found on every continent except for Antarctica and uh, by the way it's also commonly used in aquariums and ponds because it's really easy to manage. So it's an excellent phytoremediator and it's really easy to control. This has been an absolutely explosive year for coontail and we're not sure if because during February some of the plants died away because the water did freeze on the entire wetland but it's an absolutely beautiful underwater forest right now and um, you can see the lower left picture. It kind of looks like a little canal. I've I actually had visitors tell me that there was a river in our wetland and I absolutely love it. It's actually what it is. Larger fish have actually pushed the coontail to the side and have created channels and I've, I haven't seen anything like this before in four years. So it's quite a unique experience to come out and see the beautiful coontail. When you look from down, it actually looks like you're looking onto drone footage of a huge forest. All right, let's talk about duckweed. And I picked this picture up at the top on purpose because when you look at that picture, everybody looks at those little ground, little round green plants and they're like, oh, that's adorable. The duckweed is the very small, almost green, white, very small structures. The larger plant that you see there, that's actually mosquito fern. So duckweed is lemna minor. You might also have someone refer to it as water lentils or water lenses. These plants are so unique. Each one of them is an organized little phallus. And the thing of it is, is that they sometimes lack a stem altogether. They sometimes are just the leaf. Um, they have a little arenchyma pocket that actually is what keeps them floating. And the genus Wolfia has the smallest plant flower on the planet at only 0.3 um, millimeters. They are really wonderful at phytoremediation, uh, phytoremediation, look at that, 
at fight or mediation um, and have a particular ability to take some of those heavy metals that we're talking about out. So they do an excellent job, even though it's a very, very small plant. In addition to it being a small plant, it's a fantastic food source for all of our ducks. So the, the water was quite covered with um, duckweed, but we're already seeing some of our fall uh, migrators come in. And so the duckweed is actually less now than it was even last week. Now, here are some pictures that I took of duckweed. I mean, you can see the upper left over there. Those are those tiny, tiny roots. I mean, each one of these plants is only a couple of millimeters across. So I had to use my microscope for you to see those tiny rootlets. Um, my personal favorite use of the duckweed is actually as a thick organic carpet for all of the six spotted fishing spiders that you see. And oftentimes, all of the dragonflies and the dam damselflies will land on top of the duckweed. So as a photographer, I have I absolutely love duckweed because it gives me a really good opportunity to have contrast to show off some of my favorite residents at the wetland. Let's talk about a larger floating plant called pondweed. And this is Potamogeton nodosus. I absolutely love that name and because it comes from the Greek of river name river neighbor. And the reason why is because it has so many good benefits. Um, it actually helps retard algal blooms, which is very useful. We don't want to have a lot of algae because if we have a huge amount of algae covering over the water, then how are the submerged plants getting the sunlight they need to perform photosynthesis to help clean the water? So we don't want to have algal blooms and the pondweed does an excellent job of that. The other reason why I just happen to love pondweed is the leaves are ideal for insects. They use them as rafts. Some of the small snakes will actually float on them. So in the middle of the day, you'll see all the insects will be relaxing on top of the pondweed leaves as though they were large um, swim rafts. Here's some photos I took of the pond when you can see down there on the bottom left, we've got a, a beautiful um, Rambert's fork tail um, damselfly that's doing a bit of relaxing. You can see here, it's a much larger structure as far as their root in compared to the duckweed. And so obviously this is a pretty powerful phytoremediator. Um, and so it is a major part of the water cleaning process that goes on at the wetland. Again, it's also quite edible. Many of the native creatures in the area nibble on the uh, on this particular weed. So it's not only a good fighter or mediator, it's also a really good food source for a lot of different creatures. All right, let's talk about American water lotus. Um, it is um, Nelumbo lutea. Um, a lot of people come and say, oh my goodness, you have the most beautiful lily pads. And then I'm always telling them, it's not lily pads, it's American water lotus. Um, you might also um, refer to them as just American lotus or yellow lotus. I've heard water chinkapin and volet. Um, it is native to North America. The thing about American water lotus is there's so much edibility to these things. I mean, you actually can eat the seeds and they're called alligator corn. Um, these plants were actually cultivated by the indigenous people that were in the country um, many, 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 many years ago because of so much of the edibility. The rhizome itself is, is edible. Um, they even can eat the stalk on it. So as long as the plant has it actually opened up to a full bloom, a great majority of this plant is edible. Um, main reason I absolutely um, love this plant is is really for aesthetics. Um, every every June when the, when the American water lotus lotus blooms, I always think we should have a Monet contest and have painters come out and paint them because they're so absolutely beautiful. Um, the downside is the bloom time is really short. So when I tell people in June, hurry up and come see it, I really do mean in the next. Um, probably 45 days, because uh, then all of a sudden, all of the seed heads turn brown and they all look like a bunch of rusted shower heads out there on top of the fronds. Um, they do come in a beautiful, when they first open up, they're kind of a beautiful buttery yellow, and then they actually fade to, um, to a lovely creamy white before they finally turn all brown and fall off. And they really are an excellent fighter mediator. Um, my favorite um, purpose of this particular plant, though, is that snakes love to use them as pool floaties. And so it's quite entertaining to walk by and see a whole bunch of Western ribbon snakes curled up taking naps on top of the, the pool floaties that are actually the American water lotus. All right. Um, now, this is one that's a little bit more of a, a controversial plant, as it were. It's the floating primrose willow, um, Ludwigia um, peploides. Um, you might also call it the creeping water primrose. Um, it is native to the United States. Um, it's also native to um, 
to Canada and to, and to South America. However, there are many countries on the planet that actually considered a noxious weed. Um, the entire country of France nominated it to be the most annoying aquatic plant out there because it can clog waterways, but it does do an excellent job of phytoremediating. And so it is kept in check at the wetland and it is an absolutely fantastic phytoremediator. Plus again, it has a really good ability to act as a hiding ground for a lot of our macro invertebrates. Um, and those macro invertebrates, of course, are food for a lot of our larger creatures like the fish and things like that. So they definitely are an active participant in the aquatic ecosystem. This is not one where I would recommend for you to try to get floating primrose willow in your backyard pond. Absolutely not. It's way too um, difficult to manage, by the way. Um, but again, you know, a lot of these aquatic plants, they're just fantastic structures for the macroinvertebrates to land on. And so um, in addition to their phytoremediating ability, they do add a lot of aesthetics. Um, and if you're really like me and you like to watch uh, dragonflies do a lot of, um, they do a lot of mating. And as you can see on the bottom left, doing some ovipositing into the, into the water. So they are quite entertaining to, uh, to experience when you come out um, for a wetland visit. Let's go ahead and go on to our emergent plants. So these are plants that have those rhizomes anchored into the hydric soil and they emerge out of the water. The first one we're going to talk about is pickerel weed, Pontedaria cordata. It is native to all the American continents. Um, it is a fantastic plant for garden ponds. It's absolutely wonderful. If you've got a pond and you really are wanting to see bumblebees and dragonflies, this is the plant for you. It is also very tolerant of low soil oxygen and water level fluctuations. So when you have things like unexpected rain like we had in July and August where the water was extremely high and we could not actually open up the floodgates to let the water in to the Trinity because the Trinity was actually out of its banks, um, we, this plant was able to survive having the water much higher up onto a structure. Some of the other plants, as soon as the water gets too high on the structure, it can't perform its photosynthesis as well. But pickerel weed is amazingly adapted. My personal favorite thing about pickerel weed is that it is an absolutely fantastic landing area for bumblebees. You have to admit, if you're a large underwinged and overbodied flying insect, you need a flower that you can land on that's not going to bend under your weight. And so the bumblebees absolutely love the pickerel weed. Like a lot of the hydrophytes that I've talked about, pickerel weed's also quite edible. The young leaf, leaf stalks can be eaten raw. You can also eat the unripe fruits. The seeds can be eaten raw and you can grind pickerel weed seeds into grain and make a really delicious pickerel pancake if you should be so inclined. We have made pickerel pancakes at the wetland and I have to tell you, they take more syrup than you might think, but they are pretty tasty. And here are some pictures that I took of uh, pickerel weed. Um, I really do enjoy the fact that the larger insects like to hang out. And I just recently took that picture of that frog and that, <laughs> that awesome blue dasher hanging out on the thick, heavy leaves. Pickerel weed has a very large orinchoma structure. It almost looks like celery on the inside. But the leaves are so large, they really have they really support um, the larger macroinvertebrates. And these the frog in this um, day. Um, Dasher, we're actually watching an Argiopia rontia spider consume a grasshopper. And so I really imagined an interesting conversation the two of them were having while relaxing on the pickerel weed. Pickerel weed is still in bloom, by, by the way. It has such a long blooming time. So um, normally a lot of our other beautiful blooming plants in Texas are pretty much giving it up by the end of August into September. And the pickerel weed is still absolutely beautiful right now. Swamp smartweed, um, Polygonum hydropiperoides. Um, uh, I, this is something I learned um, just when I first started working at the well, and it's actually in the buckwheat family, um, and it is also known as false water pepper. Um, the thing about this particular plant and why it's there is that in addition to the phosphates and the nitrates, it takes up a lot of our toxic metals. So um, we don't really want to have too much zinc and selenium in our water, do we? And so these plants do an excellent job of taking out those excess toxic metals. Uh, they do grow to an upright height, supposedly at 40 inches, but I have to tell you, I am five foot six, and right now the swamp smartweed is about shoulder high on me, so I'm starting to wonder if that 40 inches is an average, but we've had a really um, very mild year. Um, the inflorescence is pale pink when they first bloom, and then it fades to white pretty fast, so if you're really wanting to see that pretty pink color, I have to tell you, you really have to time it right, um, because that pink flower only lasts about 24 hours before it 
ends up fading to a white color. It's still a very pretty, pretty flower anyway. And here we can see um, the swamp smartweed. Um, for those of you that really aren't into wasps, though, I'll warn you, for some reason, wasps are incredibly attracted to the uh, swamp smartweed. And uh, most of the time, I haven't gotten too many wasp stings at the wetland, but when I did get those wasp stings, it's because I was trying to get up close pictures of swamp smartweed and got myself in a bit of trouble. So be forewarned. Um, it's a fabulous phytoremediator, and I love the fact that it's taking heavy metals out of my water, but um, I've had um, more than my fair share of wasp stings this year um, as a balance of that. Now, giant bulrush is, is what we're going to call the workhorse of the wetland. Um, out of all the plants that you see, it really does have much more of a farmed appearance. There's actually, they grow these in rows, um, so it doesn't have as much of a natural appearance at the wetland. It is shown in Plectus californicus, um, also known as your California bulrush or your southern bulrush, and it is native to, um, to a good portion of the Americas. And in addition to fighter remediating, this plant has all sorts of amazing abilities. They have been making boats from this particular sedge for over 3,000 years and this plant is actually still actively farmed to harvest the sedges for the manufacturing of boats, which I just find to be amazing. Um, by the way, in case you're wondering, there are no giant bulrush sedge boat manufacturers in the United States. And um, I really wish there were, because I think that would be fascinating to actually have a bulrush boat to float around in the, in the wetland myself. Now you can really get an idea from this picture I took. You can really see those manufactured rows. Um, this is one of the plants that they definitely do focus on those prescribed burns we talked about. Um, because when they get the thatch gets built up too much, they really don't want that to hamper this hamper the growth of the new spring plants that are growing in. So they do um, a controlled burn. There has to be a lot of wind. Unlike a, a controlled forest burn where you want to be very, very low wind, they have to have wind of at least 15 miles per hour because you're really trying to catch plants that are on top of the water on fire. So we have to have enough wind to carry the fire across the plants quickly before the water actually puts the fire out. Um, um, quite an exciting thing. If you ever want to come actually see the prescribed burns, we usually take pictures of them when it's happening because it's um, something of an interest to come and see someone catch a, a wetland on fire. So kind of look out for that from December to February. All right, let's get into one of everybody's perennial favorites, duck potato arrowhead, Sagittaria latifolia. It's also known as your Indian potato, your Katniss or your Wapato. This plant is great because it really has a high affinity for phosphates and hard water, which is what we have a surplus of here in Texas. Um, it's native to Canada, US, Mexico, even Colombia, all the way down to Cuba. So it really um, goes, grows quite well. It has a high degree of edibility. Um, so again, it was another one of the plants that was actively farm by the indigenous people of the area. Um, you can eat the rhizome, you can eat the stalks, and you can actually grind the seeds up into a grain as well. So it's absolutely a fantastic plant, and it really does an excellent job of phytoremediating. You can really tell it has that that has that really characteristic arrowhead shape to the leaves, which will help you identify this plant from the next arrowhead, which is our delta arrowhead. And that is our Sagittaria platyphylla, also known as delta arrowhead. Just to make things confusing, broadleaf arrowhead or delta duck potato, which is why common names can get you in trouble depending on the part of the country that you're talking about. Um, this particular plant has a nowhere near the range as um, as the previous arrowhead. It really only ranges from the Texas uh, Florida Panhandle up to Illinois. Um, again, it has a high degree of edibility. Um, the tubers can be eaten raw, they can be roasted, they can be fried, they can be boiled. Um, the tubers can be dried and turned into grain and you can also eat the flower buds and the fruit. I happen to think Delta Arrowhead is a fantastic plant because it's where all of the little green tree frogs tend to hang out. And it's also a really great structure for Western ribbon snakes to hang out. And since I'm always on the lookout for snakes, I tend to spend a lot of time in the Delta Arrowhead. It is an excellent phytoremediator because like the other um, arrowhead, it has a really thick stalk with that arenchyma and it really looks like a huge stalk of celery. So there is an incredible amount of oxygen um, that can be transported down to the rhizosphere and uh, an incredible amount of that phytovolatilization because of those huge structures. 
And there's my adorable little Western ribs, ribbon snake. Also has a really, really pretty flower um, that is enjoyable and attracts a lot of bumblebees. The other thing, if you can see on the lower structure down there, a lot of the spiders like to build their really large webs. We get those Argiopiorontias and they'll build a five or six foot across web because the leaves are so thick due to that arenchyma, that structure, that they won't bow under the weight of the spider web. And I have taken pictures of some absolutely mammoth spider webs that have such a, have the great structure of the uh, Delta Arrowhead as their, their reinforcement beams, as it were. Now we're going to talk about cattail and cattail is um, there's um, several different species of cattail at the wetland, but the one that was actively planted and is managed by the um, North Texas Municipal Water District is the Typha domagensis. There are a couple of other species that are just natural migrants because their seeds float through the air and obviously the wetland is a fantastic habitat, um, but the Typha domagensis is the one that we have. That's the southern cattail. It is found throughout um, all the tropical tropical um, regions worldwide. And the thing about cat, about this particular species of cattail is that it really does a good job of reducing bacterial contamination. You'll often see this exact species of cattail planted on the edges of water sources for cattle because they really can do a good job of removing the bacterial contamination of the water so that all of the cattle that is going to a pond doesn't have themselves ingesting um, infected and contaminated water. So the cattails do have a really unique purpose um, at reducing that bacterial contamination. So you can kind of see there are plants that really focus on just the nitrate phosphate removal. There's plants that are really focused on the heavy metals. There's plants that can endure really wildly varying water levels, and there's plants that also do a good job at that hard water that Texas has just because of our geography here. And here's some pictures of my of the cattails. Um, I love the cattails because they're really good purchase for the drag, for the um, dragonflies. And they also happen to be the host plant for the Henry's marsh moth caterpillar that you see up there. And during um, late May and June, we have millions and millions of these caterpillars hanging out. And if you go out onto the boardwalk and you get completely quiet, you can actually hear this because there's just millions and millions of these caterpillars munching away on the um, cattail reads. So I, I highly recommend um, that you give that a try. On the upper left, you see that the cattail is going to seed. And um, right now, um, when the wind is really high, it almost looks like it's snowing out there. Um, just about done. Most of the cattail's floof has gone everywhere. And um, if you're a spider, it's quite frustrating because your spider gets completely filled up with cattail floof, which makes it a little bit hard for you to catch the insects. So I'm sure the spiders are ready for the cattail fluff to, to die down um, before the weather gets too cold and they uh, succumb to the frost. So overall, um, what I want you to take away from that is that these native plants are critical members of the water reuse ecosystem. They do perform phytoremediation of municipal water. They're an incredible food source for waterfowl. They're a beautiful habitat for macroinvertebrates. A lot of them are edible. I've explained some of the textile and manufacturing uses of them. And, and they really do provide an incredible um, degree of aesthetics in addition to their phytoremediating abilities. So I appreciate you um, letting me um, give you some information about these, um, these hydrophytes that we have at the wetland. I'm gonna discontinue sharing um, so that um, I can kind of get a little bit of a better screen without having just my own thank you note at me. And then we'll take a look to see if we have any questions. Well, Carol, that was a fantastic presentation. I, I think I learned a lot about a subject that I knew well, very little about to start with. So thank you very much for coming to share that with us. We do have some uh, some questions. Oh, uh, excellent. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, I, I, a little bit, there's a little bit of confusion here. I, I just want to make sure that I understand correctly that none of this was ever actually historically a wetland. Is that correct? That's a really great question. Um, when they did do all of the soil sampling, there were some indications that um, for a great amount of time that this area was submerged because it is low lying and the Trinity River does go around it. But there, it's, it's very difficult to say whether it necessarily was a, a true seasonal qualifying as a wetland. Um, we have had it been completely drained due to work, and we did see all sorts of interesting 
interesting grasses pop up. It is right there on the edge of the Blackland Prairie. So I don't think it necessarily was a fully functioning wetland, but I do think that it had a seasonal quality to it. Um, but uh, I had to go back a few thousand years for you uh, and take some photos to really prove whether it was actually a fully functioning wetland back then. Well, I, 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 it's a great I question, you, though. I hope you do that. <laughs> If I do, I'll be, I, I would totally win all the contests on iNaturalist at that point. So the, another thing that uh, I'd like to ask about it is that does any of the water actually flow into the river from the wetland or does it all get pumped up to Lake Levon? It's a great question. Um, it does have the capacity to send the water on down and um, to back down to the Trinity River. Um, if Lake Levon is at capacity and does not need the water, the water can actually run through the wetland and then simply be returned to the Trinity River to flow on south down into the rest of the watershed. Now, when we had those really horrendous, <laughs> when it started raining in October of 2018 and it didn't stop raining until December, <laughs> till, till two months later, um, at that point, the water actually could not be turned um, and released into the Trinity River because the Trinity River was so high that if we had actually opened up the weirs, the water would have actually run back from the Trinity River into the wetland and we would have seen some interesting flooding. So the water was completely not movable um, and sat still and we had mosquitoes the size of small cats there for about two months. Um, but the water can be returned to the Trinity if Lake Levon does not need it. Great. Um, what um, would a person do? What, what would be the experience of a person who came there as a visitor? Ah, what time of year? That's the big question. Um, well, let's say, well, let's say, because we're, we're open, well, we're open tomorrow on Saturday. So let's say you decided to come visit us on Saturday. Number one, we open at seven o'clock in the morning. So you should be there because sun rises at 7.07, I think. And you could actually see the sun rise up over the eastern side of the wetland, which is an absolutely fantastic experience. Um, what you'll have access to as a visitor is there is a six tenths of a mile boardwalk and some of the pictures you saw um, I took from the boardwalk and um, visitors are not limited to the boardwalk though they are actually have full access to the entire southern section. So all of the raised levee roads that wind in and about all those different cells that I showed you, if you walk back and forth and crisscross back and forth, you literally can get over eight miles of walking. There is absolutely no shade. So if you don't bring a hat, your experience is going to be sunburn in about an hour and a half. So I would definitely make sure that you bring good hydration and a hat. Um, but you have the ability to not only walk on the boardwalk, but to walk along all of the raised roads that divide those cells. You're going to see all of the plants that I showed you, plus more. And right now, you're already going to see some of our birds coming in. We have blue-winged teals that are already coming in. We've got some grebes coming in. Um, what else have we seen lately? Oh, the black-bellied whistling ducks are in. And I saw a whole flock of glossy ibis this morning. So you're going to see quite a bit of, um, of bird life. Uh, most likely you're going to see a lot of spiders and dragonflies, I mean damselflies. Um, you're going to have to show up really early in the morning if you want to see any of our mammals that um, are natural migrants to the area. Most likely you'll see nutria swimming in the water and, and it's pretty good snake season right now. So pretty good chance that you'll see some of our ribbon snakes or our um, dub and back water snakes. Mm -hmm. What about mosquitoes? That's a wonderful question. No, you're not going to have any mosquitoes. And you're probably wondering, what do you mean? Um, we didn't have a ban on mosquitoes. Um, number one, we all know mosquitoes have to have stagnant water. And this water is always moving. Remember, it only takes two weeks to go from the very northern section all the way to the southern section. And then it's piped back to Lake Levon. So number one, the water is moving. Uh, number two, all of the aquatic nymphs of the dragonflies and the damselflies are under the water surface and their favorite thing to eat are the larvae of flying creatures meaning mosquito larva so if you are an adult mosquito and somehow you decide you want to try to lay your eggs in the water and they actually do hatch out most likely a dragonfly or damselfly nymph is going to eat your young before you get a chance but we have so many birds that eat flying insects that honestly if you're a mosquito and you actually make it to be able to lay any eggs in the water you've got a charmed life and you should get out of the area as fast as possible and consider yourself lucky 
So uh, I take it, it seems like it's really good for birding. You mentioned the birds quite a bit. So I-, I Not in August, it's horrible to bird in August, <laughs> but yeah. the fall migrating season has already started. So um, absolutely, I saw, I saw a pair of belted kingfishers yesterday. So yeah, we're just now getting into our primo bird season, which will are last there, from now all the way till Thanksgiving. Are there, it, how unique is the is this wetland center? Is there are there other places like this that are man-made wetland centers for that are created for this purpose? Good question. There are other man-made wetlands. However, this is um, one of the largest, if not the largest, man-made wetland in the United States. Um, actually, other wetlands in the United States have been modeled after this one. Um, and it is unique in the sense that its primary function is the natural cleaning of municipal water. And it is just a, a great side effect of this situation that it attracts all of the native mammal life and all of the native bird life and all of the migratory bird life. A lot of the other wetlands, they are actually sponsored and supported by Ducks Unlimited or other um, foul uh, hunting foul organizations. And the fact that they do clean some water is a side effect of that relationship. So um, it is quite a bit of different. If you look at the plants that are at, at the wetland, they are primary plants for phytoremediation. They're not great. They're not great plants for overwintering. So we don't have huge populations of birds that come and stay. What we have is great populations of birds that come in, relax, take a rest in the water, eat a bunch of fish, eat a bunch of duckweed, and then go on to Mexico. I tell everybody we're just the world's largest buckies for birds right out in Seagaville. So these plants have, I mean, you know, you, you mentioned that they they have an affinity for heavy metals and stuff like yes. that to be in them. Is that harmful for the animals, the birds and insects that eat those plants? That's a really great question. They're not, these particular plants that take up these heavy metals, they're taking up heavy metals no matter what body of water they're in. And so um, it's really not, it's not as much of a concern because these, this, these plants do everywhere, whether it's a cattail at a pond that is somewhere else in Kaufman County, or whether it is a pond that is, you know, at the, at the wetland itself, these plants take up the heavy metals. They don't take up heavy metals to a level that is detrimental to their own structure or the plant itself wouldn't survive. I see. It's um, a great question though. About your about your visitors, uh, is there yes. is there a cost for coming there, or you, you require? Is it you, do you have to have reservations or? Okay, um, number one, you don't have to have reservations to visit. Um, we are. Um, because of COVID, we have had a great reduction in the number of schools that come to see us. So we're actually open to the public Tuesday through Saturday. Um, um, in the good old days, back, back in 2019, we actually would ask um, anybody that wanted to visit during the week to call us first, because you have to admit, birding is lousy if we have 120 middle schoolers running all over the premises, you're not going to see anything. Um, so we, we actually do recommend that you call even during the week, because we are starting to see schools come back. We're completely open to the public on um, every Saturday from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, it is $5 for anybody over 12 and up. Um, however, if you want to become a member of the John Bunker Sands Wetland Center, you pay an annual fee and then you can come visit me every single Saturday for free for a year. Which brings up another question. So uh, <laughs> is this is, is it a, a nonprofit organization or who who actually owns the center? It's a great question. So the John Bunker Sands Wetland Center is a standalone nonprofit organization, and we are on two acres that is on the edge of the 1800 acre wetland that is owned by the North Texas Municipal Water District. I did see a little question pop up under the screen, and so I'll just answer it right now because I'm there. There is land that is still owned by the Sands family right across the street. And so it's really an amazing cooperation between the water district and, um, and the city itself and the Sands family that you can drive on a public road, turn onto a private road, have a private, have a private family's still active ranch on one side of the road, park in a parking lot for a nonprofit organization, and then walk onto a boardwalk on the private property of the North Texas Municipal Water District. <laughs> A lot of cooperation with a lot of entities to make it possible. Yes. 
So here's a, some different kinds of some questions about the plants. Um, yes. What what do you think? Do you have any recommendations for the best plants for like a 300 gallon water tank, stock tank? Um, you know what? Personally, I think pickerel weed is an absolutely fantastic um, an option. Uh, I'm pretty biased because, well, it's purple. The blooms are very long lasting and they attract bumblebees. So that's kind of, you know, I'm a little bit biased on that, but they do a really good job of tolerating water. A lot of times when we have our own background ponds, we tend to let the water fluctuate more than maybe a lot of more sensitive plants would. And so that pickerel weed is incredibly forgiving to that. I also think that, and you could look into the arrowheads. Um, and if you've got 300 gallons, I really would go for American and water lotus. What do you think about uh, lizard tail? <laughs> it's fun. Um, it's attentive. You have to be attentive. <laughs> <laughs> so as long as you're really keeping your eye on things, I think you'll do fine. But um, there are a lot of those aquatic plants that they look so fun and the amount of maintenance that goes into them is not is not necessarily as clear. Sorry, my phone is going off. I have it on quiet, but it's the no, war is not being declared and that's not a call to arms. All right. <laughs> um, what about uh, giant versus uh, soft stem uh, bulrush? Uh, giant bulrush is, depending on how big your pond is, it's giant. Um, and it's really quite quite unwieldy and it's going to take a lot of maintenance so i don't i don't consider giant bulrush to be to be in the non-industrial side or if you've got a really really large I mean, if you've got a two acre pond I, I think completely you could you could work with that um but for a small for a smaller backyard operation that is a pretty large plant um and it does take a lot of maintenance because you do have to cut back the thatch or it'll choke itself off in probably three or four seasons you know, and who wants to start all over on a pond every three to four seasons? Because it takes a season and a half just to get the thing settled. We had a question here about the which caterpillar that was. I believe that was on a slide, probably uh, close to the end of your presentation. It was the Henry's Marsh Moth. Henry's Marsh Moth. Yes, they're so fun. I absolutely love them. And they're one of the caterpillars that they all look all fuzzy and hairy. You're thinking, oh my gosh, that must be a horrible ass. And there's no stinging involved. And not that you should handle them just because I don't think that's very nice. We get our body oils on those hairs and it can really impact their mobility. But those are the Henry's Marsh Moth. Um, you've missed their season. Their season is just about wrapped up. But definitely, um, if you want to go if you want to go uh, Marsh Moth watching, um, you should put that in your calendar for, um, for May and June. And uh, the moths are totally nocturnal, so good luck. You'd have to you have to come to one of our evening before the s'mores, or we had an incredible moth night um, at the wetland this year, and we got to see those uh, very nocturnal, not so socially um, friendly moths. Um, you never see them during the day, um, but we had a really good event there. So we are, and, and that gives me a good opportunity to say that we are open in the evenings once a month. We're open from six to nine p.m. We have a family open house um, called the Before the S'mores where we have a featured speaker. Um, we have guest, um, guests that come into our resource room and um, we have a craft for the kiddos and either myself or my husband, who's also a master naturalist, we have a themed cocktail to match the whole evening. We do walks on the boardwalk and then we all gather our chairs and we make s'mores and sing campfire songs to round it out. It's, it's fantastic. And the next one is actually next Friday. How do we, how do we find out about these events? Um, the easiest way to do is that um, you can, if you go to our, uh, on Facebook, we're quite active on Facebook and we put all of our listings on Facebook. That's probably the best way. You can also go to our website and look for our events, um, but our website is currently being updated. So I think maybe checking Saturday on the website. I know for a fact, our website administrator had taken the whole website down today and was working on it and hoping to finish it by tomorrow afternoon. Okay, we I, I did have another question here mm -hmm. that has come up again. Let's see if I can find it about phosphorus for release. So let me see if I can find that question again. Uh, is the phosphate released as ash in particulate matter following the, uh, the your prescribed burnings? How much actually leaves the wetland area? 
It's a really good question. Phosphate is um, sequestered in two different formats. Sometimes the plants sequester it down into the rhizosphere, into the hydric soil. And that is why we are always concerned with invasive fish like the European carp, um, because those no good fish, they, they like to burrow and stir up that hydric soil and make the water all cloudy. So instead of a beautiful clear wetland, it looks like we have 1800 acres of latte out there. And that stirs all the phosphate back up. Well, we don't want the phosphate to be stirred up. We kind of want it to stay down and be settled so that the water above that is nice and clean. We don't want to send phosphate filled water back to Lake Levon. Phosphate is released in those prescribed burns, absolutely. Um, and that's why they do so much attention to making sure that anybody with respiratory sensitivities are aware that the burning is going on. The wind can't even blown. Um, it is, it looks like a latte. It's, it's really gross. Uh, it looked like yeah. that a few weeks ago. It was just disgusting. Um, but they have to make sure that the wind actually is not blowing on to Highway 175 because the smoke is so thick it actually could, um, could disrupt the drivers on 175. And the last thing we want is to have an accident. But yeah, the 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 phosphate cannot be phytovolatilized by the plants. So when they do the burn, it is releasing phosphate um, in the ash. And that's why they do it in small batches. They do not burn um, a huge portion of the wetland at a time because we don't want to over contaminate the air. So they do it in very small batches and gradually. That's why they take from December all the way to February to get the different cells taken care of. Well, uh, that's, uh, that's, I don't believe we have any more questions, uh, Carol. It's really a great presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Cindy or Carol, do you have any um, questions? Or No, I just thought that was a terrific program. I, I grew up going fishing with my daddy all the time. And uh, I just, I, it just brings back great memories about the things that I saw out on, on the, on the lakes. Um, back then but um yeah and I, I took my kids a lot to to wetland centers when they were growing up so it was uh i just i just i just have great memories of that but thank you carol for 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 doing this program for us um i did want to